The 25th anniversary season of the Pirelli World Challenge is shaping up to be one of the most competitive ever. Today, we're on the mean streets of Belle Isles in Detroit, Michigan. Traction and low speed handling are critical on this very technical track, and Cadillac, Chevy, and Ford are all hungry for a hometown win. Hi everybody and welcome to the Optima Battery Fan Zone here at Detroit's Belle Isle for the standing start, our pre-race show for the Pirelli World Challenge. We're about ready to get going with round number six of the Pirelli World Challenge Championships, the Cadillac V-Series Challenge at Belle Isle presented by the Detroit Metro Cadillac dealers. Round five of the championship yesterday was an absolute brouhaha, some fascinating racing. I alluded to it at the very top of the show, Johnny O'Connell, who has coming in to the fifth round of the championship and won three of the four races that GT ran here on the mean streets of Belle Isle in the last couple of years. He finished second in the other one. Well, yesterday he added win number four out of five. It's an amazing run. He seems to just soak up the pressure that these teams all feel that are racing American cars here on Belle Isle in the shadow of the GM World Headquarters and all of the great automotive history here in Detroit. He seems to revel in it, and it shows. He had an immensely strong performance once again, got off to a great start, and was able to hang on when they got into traffic and the like and put together a great run. Conversely, in the GTS category, it was a war. Dean Martin, who won in is only his second start in the Pirelli World Challenge in the second race of Detroit last year, which was his first weekend with the series, came back this year, had a huge crash, if you've been following the series, in Barber Motorsports Park, four of the leading Ford contenders taken out. They had to rebuild the car up basically from ground zero, yet Dean able to put it on the pole, hang on for the win. It was a great race, but behind him, it was furious. He was under attack a lot of it, positions changing left and right. In the end, Jack Baldwin came home in second, uh, and that was an amazing story in its own right with some great racing behind them as well. But up in the GT ranks, there is a young man who has leapfrogged from the very first race of the season from GTA for the non-professional driver. He podiumed, went right into the GT ranks, got a win at Barber. He had an interesting weekend thus far leading up into round five of the championship, then produced a storming race. Let's check in with young Andrew Palmer. We had a great launch off the start. Um, we were able to secure, I think, fourth place, then pass Lazaro early on. Skeen and I were going through traffic. I had a, a little bit of a bad break um, in terms of moving through traffic, and he got a gap again, so the yellow flag really helped us. Uh, and then on the restart, he just gave me just enough room to get by and took him on a late-breaking move and, and made it through one, and then it was just all about defending Lazaro. I mean, after the restart, there's a lot of oil and rubber buildup on the tires, um, and, our, and it's not good with the Audis in terms of the front wheel grip uh, coming off a long caution period. So. Is really hanging on. We came away with the second place, which is really, I think, the best we could have finished given how quick the Cadillac is here. You know, I mean, we saw today they're not invincible with Pilgrim breaking down. I think they're being a little conservative right now in terms of showing their speed. I think they have a little bit more left in the sack. Um, so it's going to take some mistakes, but uh, if they run all out and, are, and hit their marks, it's going to be really, really hard to do it. But we're up for the challenge. This is the first race that we've ever used uh, Audi's new developed launch control. So that really, really helped. Before it was all just using the clutch and the gas, trying to feel that sweet spot. And uh, too much wheel spin, you know, cost us on a lot of starts. So having a, a, a systematic way of going through and launching really helped us. And I think we gained almost four positions just off the start. So. Well, again, a couple of great stories that we've talked about in the two different classes. We're going to step away for just a minute here from the standing start. But when we come back, we have a very special guest for you, the winner of yesterday's GTS race from pole, Dean Martin. This is home. This is one he wants again. And welcome back to the Optima Battery Fan Zone here at Detroit's Belle Isle as we continue to move forward to round six of the Pirelli World Challenge Championships, the Cadillac V-Series Challenge here at Belle Isle, presented by the Detroit Metro Cadillac Dealers. As we said, going into the break, we got a very special guest here. It's a guy who you might think is a bit of a ringer based on what he's done in only two appearances here at the uh, raceway at Belle Isle and not that many appearances in the Pirelli World Challenge. We're talking, of course, about Dean Martin. Dean, uh, last year you showed up, the first time you ever ran World Challenge, first time you ran the series here at Belle Isle, doubleheader weekend, you win the second one. It was an opportunistic move at the right moment with that wreck right at the end. This year you're running much more of a full season approach to the uh, series, yet you come in here to Belle Isle after an immense wreck where four yeah. Fords were absolutely totaled yeah. at Barber. You guys did a thrash repair, basically took a show car and turned it into a race car almost and put it on pole. One amazing job by the team. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my uh, my lead mechanic Jesse Jesse Cox is uh, is phenomenal. You know, he 
he and I work together really well on that Mustang. And uh, it pays off, you know. It's, it's, it seems like it's the, the thing to do is to bring a brand new car here to Detroit. It's, it's, <laughs> it's always amazing, a good luck charm for us. Well, it's interesting too, obviously. Uh, you know, you've done lots of racing in other series. Uh, you had that taste last year, certainly, but you know, what made you decide to spend a little bit more time with the Pro League World Challenge this year? Uh, my sponsor, uh, Gino Lucci and Picture Cars East, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he, he called me up and said, hey, you know, if, you're, uh, if you want to do the full season, I'll, uh, I'll help support you. And, and at that point, I said, all right, let's go ahead and do it. So we had actually uh, intended to run the car in a different series and had to convert it. Uh, between Homestead and uh, St. Pete, we had two weeks to convert it to a World Challenge car and, uh, and managed to make it work. And, uh, and it had a good run at St. Pete until uh, you know, we were out leading and, and, uh, and the transmission failed on yeah. us. So, uh, but we've been, it's been pretty good. But, you know, we're looking forward to the rest of the year. Hopefully we can stay out of trouble and keep the car clean. Now in yesterday's race, we talked about it. you put it on pole, uh, you came in, we were able to you know, convert that into a win and another frantic race as we always see an awful lot going on with the two classes out there. What is it about this track that seems to suit you so well? Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure. I just, it's, uh, it's one of those places, it's funny, Johnny O'Connell made the comment earlier, when, you know, he's talking about Sears Point when it used to be dangerous. <laughs> and I think that's what it is, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I like I like tracks that are dangerous. I, you know, I, I just ignore the fact that the walls are there, and you know, and you know, you can't be conservative when you're racing here in Detroit. You gotta go after it. Uh, and the, the track really suits the Ford Mustang. The Boss 302 is it's just a fantastic engine, uh, and it really suits this track. And and I seem to have a good rhythm for the place. And, and I just like it. And it's, a, it's the hometown track, so you gotta, you got to do well here. I was going to say, Detroit, the spiritual home of the, of the American automobile industry. So for any, anybody running a manufacturer that's based in this area, this one's special. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, actually, you got to win it in a Mustang because it's sponsored by GM, right? So we got to uh, get a little there. There's the old glove across <laughs> the face right there. Can you back it up today? We're going to try. We're going to do right, our my best. Friend. We're going to let you run. We know you got to suit up and get ready to get out of getting that car for that race. Absolutely great run once again. Thanks for joining us here right. on The Standing Start. Thank you very much. All right. Dean Martin, folks. Now, before we run, though, we've got a special treat for you. Dean, you don't need this the way you've been running. You're good. <laughs> but we've got the Cadillac Key Corners. You're going to ride on board with the guy who has now won five of the last six races in GT here on the mean streets of Belle Isle, one Johnny O'Connell. Enjoy this. I am Johnny O'Connell with Cadillac Racing. This is the Detroit Grand Prix, and these are the Cadillac Key Corners. Turn one, taking in the fourth gear. Very fast corner and it changes into turn two. What's cool about it, there's this ride right here. Car gets a little bit loose, then it's up the gearbox. Fifth gear, sixth gear, getting into top speed. And as we go into turn three, this is one of our best overtaking areas. Move to the inside, it's easy to get by a guy. Down in the second for turn three, up into fourth gear. This next complex, four, five, great combinations. Four, the car understeers through here. We use a lot of road still. Maintaining third gear, five, difficult left-hander to get through. Use all the road again coming out. And then as we go into six, uh, turn six, second gear corner. Accelerate hard out, third gear. The back straightaway here in Detroit, very bumpy. And because it's moving on you left and then right, hard to get by a guy, but we get all the way up into sixth gear. And then a very challenging braking zone for turn seven. Hard right-hander, you bring it right up next to the curbing. Use all the road coming out, then hard on the brakes into turn eight. A little bit of a bump down into second gear, accelerating through turn nine. Long left-hander. Okay, corner keeps coming at you. Your car gets a little bit loose, then down into second gear for turn 10. Explode out of that corner in second gear. Third gear, fourth gear. Now on the trickier corners on the racetrack. 11, it's like a little bit of kink to the right here. You get in close to your curve, accelerate out into fourth gear. Turn 12, try not to lift. Use all the road coming out. If you do it right, you'll be able to get into sixth gear before start finish. You look down at your dash and see a great lap time. And those were the Cadillac Key Corners from the Detroit Grand Prix. I know those of you who are really sharp out there caught it. I'm already giving Johnny O'Connell more credit than this amazing talent deserves. He's now won four of five, not five of six. He's got to get that one if he wants that fifth one. He needs to do that in just a few minutes. That means we're going to wrap things up here on The Standing Start, our pre-race show for the Pro League World Challenge. It is time for round six of the Pro League World Challenge, the Cadillac B-Series Challenge here at Belle Isle, presented by the Detroit Metro Cadillac Dealers. I'm off to the booth to join Jeremy Shaw. We're going to go green in just a minute. Don't go anywhere. Now we move into the GT division. These are all GT cars. We'll mention our subcategory GTA guys as well. Starting in the ninth row, he will be in the 18th overall starting spot in the number 95 Swisher Racing Global Motorsports Group Audi R8 Ultra, Bill Ziegler, one of our A drivers. 
Starting 17th is the number 44, GMG Racing, Global Motorsports Group, Audi Ultra, his teammate, another A driver, Brent Holden. Starting in the 16th spot, another of our A drivers in GT, in the Dragon Speed, Ferrari 458 Italia, number 10, Henrik Hedman. Had a great run yesterday, by the way, to fourth in the GTA category. Starting 15th in GT, another A driver in the Spectre United Steel Valspar Audi R8 Ultra. It's the number 32 of Brett Curtis, who was second in GTA yesterday. A great run. All right, folks, it is time for us to make the announcement. Please start clearing the grid. All non-essential personnel, please clear the grid. The gentleman who won the GTA category yesterday with a great run into a 10th overall finish in GT in the glorious ACS Manufacturing Performance Speed Tech Dodge SRT Street and Race Technology Viper GT3R. The number 80, one of our rookies, Dan Knox. A great run indeed. Starting 13th overall and a great run as well. One of our A drivers in the Black River Caviar Mercedes AMG SLS GT3. It is the number 54 of Tim Pappas. Starting in the 12th spot is the writer engineering Blau Pharmaceutical Lamborghini Gallardo FL2 of uh, Brazil's Marcelo Hahn, one of our A drivers. Starting in the 11th spot overall, the fastest driver during the race. He sits atop, if you will, the GTA grid. Best qualifying effort in GTA in the effort racing Porsche GT3R, the number 41 of Michael Mills. The top 10 are all straight up GT drivers. Starting 10th in the team effort racing Porsche will be the number 31 of Germany's Tim Bergmeister. Starting in the ninth spot in the R Ferry Motorsports Ferrari Lake Forest Ferrari 458 GT3 is Nick Mancuso from Chicago. Comes in here tied for fifth in the points. The gentleman is his teammate, will start eighth, is second in the points, only 17 out of first in his R Ferry Motorsports Ferrari of Ontario. Ferrari 458 GT3 Italia out of Atlanta, Georgia. It is Anthony Lazaro, number 61. Starting in the uh, seventh spot is the number six, one of our young guns in the Capex Racing McLaren 12C GT3. It is Robert Thorne. Starting in the sixth spot, number 14, currently tied for uh, fifth in the points, was a pole sitter here last year. Now in the Spider Thermal Club Global Motorsports Group Audi, James Safron is number 14, starting fifth, will be number Nine, Alex Figgy in the team K Pax McLaren. A great run for him. Starting, he finished fifth yesterday, by the way. Finishing fourth yesterday, starting fourth today in the Hawk Performance. Audi R8 Ultra. It is Mike Skeen starting third. A great story we'll talk more about. The number 21 of the young gun for Global Motorsports Group, Andrew Palmer. Phenomenal job. And your front row, Andy Pilgrim, will be starting second in the Cadillac Racing CTS VR number eight. And on the pole, going for his fifth win in six races. He has won four of the last five over the previous two years and yesterday's event. The remarkable driver of the Cadillac CTS VR from Cadillac Racing, number three, one Johnny O'Connell. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time. It is the Cadillac CTSV Challenge presented by the Detroit Metro. Cadillac dealers, it is time for me to turn it over to Jim Verplot, Global Marketing Manager for Cadillac, to set this field on its way once again. On behalf of our friends at Pirelli Tires, and Optima Batteries, and all of our Cadillac dealers and employees worldwide. Welcome to the Cadillac V-Series Challenge on beautiful Belle Isle. Drivers, start your engines. That's how you do that. We're going racing, throwing it up to the booth, and Jeremy Shaw. Thank you very much indeed, Greg Creamer. A full grid of 41 cars online here at Belle Isle. The weather conditions absolutely perfect. It's actually warming up a bit more than I anticipated this morning. So track conditions are, are absolutely perfect. It is a bit warm, but the sun is shining. Blue skies, green uh, greenery around the race track is a fabulous setting here on Belle Isle. Just a couple of miles away from the Renaissance Center, the home of GM and Cadillac uh, in Detroit, Michigan, Motor City. And what a grid we've got lined up for you here. There's eight different manufacturers in the GT category from uh, all over the world. And the GTS category is just as extensive as well. Five, six different manufacturers there. 
F uh, four of them have already won races this season. This is the sixth round of the Pirelli World Challenge, the 25th season of this ever-evolving and growing championship that brings you some of the best sports car racing in North America, if not the world. It certainly expanded this year with the adoption of the FIA specification GT3 cars that race literally all around the world. And that has brought, I think, a new dimension to this championship, as well as a host of competitors from all over the globe. We've got drivers from Europe, from South America, and uh, many of the top drivers in North America as well. This is going to be another classic race. Yesterday was a thriller. The Cadillac of Johnny O'Connell, as Greg Creamer was saying, was very much the class of the field yesterday. He also set the fastest lap of the race, and it, it is those laps that were set yesterday during the race by each of the competitors that sets the grid for this morning's round. Johnny O'Connell, therefore, will start on the pole position. He'll have his teammate alongside him. Yesterday, Andy Pilgrim was beaten away on the first lap by Mike Skeen, and Johnny O'Connell took full advantage, and he just checked out at the beginning of the race, was able to manage that gap as the race progressed, and come away with a fine victory here. As Greg was saying, this is his fourth win in five starts here on the streets of Belle Isle. The cars will do one warm-up lap now. They will take their positions back on the starting grid. This will be a standing start. And again, it's a, uh, it's a real spectacle for you. For those of you down there in turn one, you're going to have a treat coming up in just a few minutes. There's a very short drag race from the front of the grid into turn one. Absolutely flat out, it'll be through that corner. And there's going to be a lot of excitement, I think, here. Uh, many of the cars have traction control systems. Uh, very advanced electronic systems on the cars to help the drivers get them off the line. Some of them, however, do not. So that uh, creates kind of an imbalance and it, it, it surely makes some, ex for some exciting action on the first lap. Drivers now just trying to build some heat into their Pirelli tyres. Almost all the contenders here will start on a brand new set of tyres for this race. So they've got to make sure they get enough heat into the tyres now on this warm-up lap and then use that... Uh, try and get them up to their optimum working temperature so when the, the, grid, the race gets underway, they will be able to use the ultimate performance right away. And certainly the tires are at their very, very best at their ultimate performance for the, the first three or four laps in particular. And after that, the drivers really have to manage their cars. These are big, heavy cars and the tires take a real beating around here. The Pirellis work extraordinarily well, but uh, it, they certainly get a workout on this very demanding racetrack. The leaders now coming around to take up their positions on the starting line. As a result of yesterday's victory, Johnny O'Connell moved back into the lead in the championship points table for the GT category. He leads Anthony Lazaro now by a mere 11 points coming into this weekend. Anthony Lazaro finished yesterday in third place, uh, but the differential between first and second place in terms of points is huge. 152 points for Johnny O'Connell yesterday, just 95 for finishing in third place for Anthony Lazaro. So we'll see some big shuffles uh, in, the, in the race today as well, I am sure. In the GTS category, the win yesterday for Dean Martin vaulted him all the way from uh, outside the top 20 into ninth place in the points, but the points table is led by the veteran driver, Jack Baldwin. Finished second yesterday. He took over the, the lead in the points overall from the Kia drivers. Mark Wilkins now in second place. Nick Johnson, his teammate, in third place. Those top three contenders separated by just 13 points. This is going to be... Uh, we've got the uh, rear end of the field... Just about lining up now in the GTS cars. There's 41 cars on this grid. It is action-packed. Greg Kreber has sprinted back <laughs> to the front of the field and is here to take us through the starting lineup. Oh, I didn't want to miss moments. this, man. This is just unbelievable. <laughs> We're getting reports now from race control officially. The grid is set. There is the board. For the, there is the board for the grid board. And what that means is now we will have another sign. You can see just where that gal is getting off track, folks, who are joining us here on the web and watching on the big screens. There will be another sign displayed. It means, there it is, five seconds. So within five seconds now, we will be racing. We have a set of lights that go on. When they go off, we go racing. The revs are up. Watch for it. Round six, the Cadillac V-Series Challenge about to begin. The sixth round of the championship. We're green! Again, a great launch by the Cadillac. Good start by Palmer, Jeremy down, trying to get to the inside of Andy Pilgrim. And we've got a problem with stall for the number 34, Natural Cures, Aston Martin. But it looks as though everybody was able to skate through. It continues to be a Cadillac 1-2. Palmer right there in that blue and white Audi with the red highlights. But a great launch by Mike Skeen. 
Indeed, Mike Skinner, he felt aggrieved yesterday at the start. We see Nick Mancuso running wide at turn three and losing a couple of places to the McLarens. His teammate also alongside that, Anthony Lazaro and Nick Mancuso side by side through turn four, heading up for turn five on the inside of the line. It was Nick Mancuso, but it is Anthony Lazaro, the more experienced driver, who slots into that position as they head up to turn six. Yeah, he was, uh, I mean, Mancuso, he thought he saw an optimistic attempt there to drive right around the outside, suddenly saw the wall come up on him <laughs> yeah. at a great rate of speed, had to check up big time and dip the brake. But we are underway, and, uh, boy, I'm telling you, this is going to be a fantastic race again. 50 minutes, 50 minutes of racing, and the two Cadillacs doing what they wanted to do yesterday, get up front, stay up front. So we are looking forward to uh, this unfolding in a great hurry. And of course, that battle in the back, you knew that Tony Buffamonte was going to be doing everything he could. And he's now got both Dean Martin and it looks like Alec Udell have put Bill Ziegler between them and uh, Buffamonte. And that is going to drive Buffamonte insane with the speed we saw that he had in this morning warm up. Yeah, absolutely right. We've got some, some tremendous battling here. And a couple of the contenders there in GTS have got themselves ahead of one of the GT cars, that's Bill Ziegler, who is uh, in the middle of that pack there now. So that's going to create some problems for the guys behind him until uh, Bill can get that car up to speed. He must have made a bad getaway there, and he's got two of the uh, Ford Mustangs that got around him now, and then the rest of the pack is kind of bottled up behind him. So it is in there. It is Dean Martin who leads, but Alec Udell, <laughs> the youngster, is right with him in second place. Boy, and I'll tell you, Andy Lee got a, you know, he had a good qualifying run based on his lap in the race, and right now he had to go defensive because both of the Kias were looking to get around him, and as a matter of fact, Lawson Aschenbach doing it again, Jeremy. This guy is so opportunistic, and the number 38 there came up the inside trying to make a move on his teammate, and uh, that was Wilkins on Janssen. Janssen defended a little bit. It slowed Wilkins down and again we have seen Lawson Aschenbach take advantage of opportunity and go right on by. Now Wilkins is going to try and get by around the outside of Aschenbach down this long run down the strand and let's see does he do it? He knows his ahead. Aschenbach almost wanted to give him a little bit of a nudge there but Wilkins shuts the door. Aschenbach has to give. And Lawson Aschenbach he had some problems yesterday. He was running yes, amongst that uh, big lead pack and had a shock absorber broke on that number 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 one Black Dog Speed Shop Chevrolet Camaro. They've repaired that overnight. They don't really know what caused it. It was a very strange and unlikely yeah. occurrence on that car, but the car is back up to speed now, and they feel they made some gains with the setup overnight. Lawson Archenbach is feeling racy this morning. Yeah, you know, a couple of unusual things. Randy Pilgrim's car just suddenly had a left front brake rotor uh, come apart. That just, you know, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, he did a masterful job of controlling it. They got into the pits, fixed it, and he went back out, but was way, way down the order. So right now, those two Cadillacs, and once again, folks, the uh, the scenario for these cars, the Cadillacs built to the GT World Challenge GT rules, not the FIA GT3 spec. They're a little more powerful, but they're therefore heavier. But what that does, especially with the great amount of adjustability in the suspensions of these Cadillacs, it allows those Pirelli P0 slicks to come in a little quicker. They can get heat, they get performance a little faster than these GT3 cars. That's when they want to gap the field a little bit because eventually when these GT3 cars finally get those tires up to temp and the pressures are right and that really activates the car, brings it to life, uh, that's when they can start and run things down. And we saw that unfold yesterday in that great march to the front by Andrew Palmer. So right now the caddies doing what they want to do, Jeremy, open up a little bit of breathing room. And part of it is, is when they catch the back of that GTS field, it gives them the ability to be a little little bit more uh, comfortable in how they're going to try and make passes and moves and not have to push too much. But we did see yesterday once the GT leaders caught the GTS field, getting past some of these cars is, is easier said than done. And yes. you could easily lose three or four seconds a lap as we saw for Johnny O'Connell trying to thread his way through. And sometimes if you're the p pursuer in, the, in that situation, it is possible to take advantage of the leader being held up. And that is certainly would be what Andy Pilgrim would be hoping for. Well, and we have a full course yellow. So everything yeah. we just talked about in trying to get that gap built, make some room, has gone for naught at this point. As I don't know why we have not seen yet, folks, uh, 
apparently it's something down in the turn two area, but we have not seen exactly what has happened yet. I see a debris flag being displayed the upper right corner underneath the bow tie. If you're watching online or on uh, the big screens, you see that yellow flag with the red stripes, and then there's a waving yellow in front of it. That that. Uh, flag with the stripes means a change in the surface technically something in debris fluid something but now the field is under control of the pace car our Optima batteries best standing start uh, here it was the number 14 of James Sophronis in the Spider Thermal Club Global Motorsports Group Audi R8 Ultra as uh, he got the best standing start uh, that's a positions advance from the green to coming around completing the first lap so congratulations to Mr. Sophronis doing a nice job right now so uh, again we're still waiting I have not heard anything definitively from race control and we have not seen anything visually Jeremy as to what may have caused this caution we haven't uh, so we're maybe some debris on the track we saw a, 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 a glimpse from the camera there of turn two it didn't seem to be anything untoward in that area of the racetrack but uh, clearly there's something amiss somewhere around and that is why the yellow has been shown so the safety car is out there the Cadillac safety car and uh, so three Cadillacs now there, so therefore at the front of the field. Then three Audis, then a couple of McLarens, followed by a couple of Ferraris, and then a couple of Porsches as well. So they're all kind of in... Uh, in uh, oh, oh, there it is. That's problem. Jack Roush Jr., I believe. No, no that's Jeff Reeves, folks. Heavy contact, car yeah. number 40. One of our rookies here, a former Navy SEAL, uh, and is coming along very nicely, part of that Best IT program and that Shadow Works Camaro. But he's gotten pretty firmly into the barriers there. And now we've got some of the EV crews on site. Always a great response. And of course, they'll get in there and uh, assess the car, you know, as well as the driver, obviously, uh, but also see what, uh, you know, what is going to be needed to get that car cleared and removed. So I uh, always hate to see these yellows in a, in a rather short 50 minute timed event, but such is the nature sometimes of uh, the intensity of the Prelude World Challenge on, uh, on a street course. I think that must, is that turn seven where that is? Hard to say. I think it. I think it must be turn seven, but certainly uh, a heavy yeah. impact there for uh, that number 40 car. There's a lot of damage to the rear end of it, and uh, we haven't seen the driver jumping out. But it doesn't seem to be too much urgency amongst the safety team there. Yeah. Well, uh, for the driver, the smart thing sometimes is to stay put until yeah. that field is under control. Obviously. So it sounds like they have called immediately now for a rollback or a tilt bed, if you will, to get that car up and uh, and removed. And the field uh, just uh, very carefully, as they should, trundling through that section of track. Um, you know, as it went, obviously, we have O'Connell, Pilgrim, the two Cadillacs up front, Palmer in the Audi third, Skeen in the uh, Hawk Performance Audi fourth, and Sophronis with that great start now up into fifth. Anthony Lazaro and Nick Mancuso, who were so quick and effective yesterday, sitting in eighth and ninth right now. And then moving back into the GTS, Dean Martin, doing what he did yesterday, starting from pole, hanging on to the lead. But Alec Udell kind of got buried a little bit yesterday at the start with a couple of other guys getting a little bit better start. Not today, Udell right there in second. And he and Martin, by virtue of putting Bill Ziegler between them and Tony Buffamani, it opened up a little bit of room. And they wanted to turn this into a mano a mano battle. But uh, obviously this yellow will will take that away, and which brings Tony Buffamani right back into this. With that lap he turned this morning, uh, in the warm-up, that would have been a pole record for the race yesterday. Uh, if he could stay close, this should be spectacular. Okay, and that is on the exit of turn two. You're absolutely right, of course. Uh, the, the, the view we got before, yeah. the uh, inside wall there, which is which is way off the racing line, was obscured by uh, right. some of the catch fencing there. So uh, clearly it, it, it would appear uh, that uh, Mr. Reeves lost the, the control of the car. You could see, you could see from that shot there was some uh, blick, big black rubber marks on the <laughs> yeah. outside leading off the racing line and going in the wrong direction uh, and it really appeared he lost control coming off turn two there's a kind of a hub there where the, the cars go go light over a sort of a bridge right uh, uh, over one of the little waterways here and uh, it's very easy to lose control of that part of the race track we've seen many people do it in the past and it caught out jeff reeves there and he backed the car across the road and heavily into the wall so a great change for those guys they've got a lot of work to do to get that car repaired again for next time won't be racing against against David. The cleanup sh hopefully shouldn't be too long, and we'll get to act back to action here. But yeah, the, it's interesting, certainly, isn't it? As it was yesterday, the Cadillacs just get on their game right away. The cars yeah. are clearly working extremely well, and those two very experienced veteran drivers in the, at the wheel of those two cars, Johnny O'Connell and Andy Pilgrim, making full use of their cars' effectiveness right away on cold tires. 
Uh -oh. Yeah, getting a look at exactly what you were talking about there in the big screens, and he, he backed it in pretty substantially. And if you've ever been to a driving school, you've heard the phrase TTO, trailing throttle oversteer, and that may have been exactly what it was. You feel it starting to go, and instead of doing what you need to do is maybe actually give it a little gas, try and get some weight back. You lift for just a second, goes light on the back, and around it goes. And, uh, you know, getting back to what you're talking about with the Cadillacs, being so good so fast in the GT3 cars. Anthony Lazaro put it beautifully uh, after uh, during St. Pete we were talking to him, and he said it just takes these cars a little longer to wake up, was yeah. how he put it. And that's really it. It, it, it is. You know, it, it, the, the tires were sort of barely up to full temperature at that stage, just on lap, lap uh, two of the race. So, uh, you know, the car oversteered a little bit coming over that little crest there. He corrected the car, then it, then it bit again. And in the immortal words of Richard Petty, the king of NASCAR <laughs> stock car racing, uh, he got a little bit behind on his steering. Exactly. Uh, and the back end got around and he, he crossed the road and, and again, that heavy impact. So great show for Jeff Reeves. He's a, a, a rookie at this level and making his way in, in the series and you know, picking up experience, but certainly that's a, not the sort, sort of experience he wants to draw from this morning. Exactly. Uh, one of my first driving schools way too long ago, we don't even want to talk about that, but uh, somebody in the, in the uh, school asked one of the instructors, uh, he said, so I've heard this, these terms before, what's the difference between understeer and oversteer? Or, or push and loose, and the, and the uh, instructor said, well, well, the difference is is uh, with understeer, you see what you're going to hit. And that's basically, you know, he that, that car got loose and backed it in. That's what happens so yeah. very you know, often here. Oversteer, the back end of the wall hits the car. Uh, back end of the car hits <laughs> the wall first. <laughs> exactly. And, and understeer, the front end of the car hits the wall first. Yes, there are different, different, different ways of looking at that thing, but uh, that sit situation, unfortunately, the, uh, the same outcome, you're going to hit the wall. Yeah, that's the bad news just past 12 minutes elapsed, so there's still plenty of time. If they can get that car removed fairly quickly, we can get back and uh, still have a good solid chunk of racing to unfold here in this sixth round of the championship. And it was interesting, you know you, you know, you take a look at where things were in the points coming in, Jeremy, and then after yesterday's race, uh, Johnny O'Connell, uh, with that absolutely flawless performance, pole, and there, there are uh, points awarded for pole, and then all the points for the win, leading every lap, leading the most laps, there are all these little bonus points. It propelled him up into the point lead by 17 over the guy who uh, sits in second, Anthony Lazaro, who right now is quite a bit down the order uh, in the eighth spot. And uh, so now Anthony Lazaro has his work cut out for him. And the whole scenario is, is the next round in the championship that we go to is going to be uh, at uh, another look at it here. You know, I think you're right because you can see Reeves' car, suddenly it just did this wiggle right as it came over that rise. And uh, it just gave that wiggle, so I think it got light, it pushed, then he lifted, and the back end came around, didn't it? Yeah, it looks yeah. like exactly that's uh, what happened. It, uh, it's a certainly a shame for him, and it's broken up this race a little bit. But, mm -hmm. yeah, we're going to see what happens here at the restart. The tires, of course, they, they, by the time they, they'd done three racing laps before the caution came out, so they got those tires pretty much up to racing temperatures. But now, of course, running under yellow, they cool off very, very rapidly. Let's have another look at, at here at the standing start. Yeah, watch the white number 34 in the bottom right of your screen. That's a Saiyan, and he's the one who never, you, you just see that? It moved, yeah, and then it stalled. Yeah, he tried to get into gear. Boy, and everybody packed up behind him there. They're very closely, tightly packed on the grid there, and if somebody does stall it, that's what happens. You know, it's, uh, I was surprised, quite frankly, how closely the field was packed there yeah. for the standing start. The problem, of course, here is there really isn't the long straightaway on which to hold a standing start on this Bellar Raceway. So you have to, the cars really have, by ne definition, to be fairly close together. But unfortunately, for the two guys directly behind uh, Nick is saying there, that would have been Mitch Landry, I think, and Mark Clennon. Exactly. They uh, were absolutely nothing they could do, but they had just had to wait, be patient, while everybody else went past on either side of them, and then they could get underway as well. So those two uh, have been... Uh, very much inconvenience and we're right at the back of the pack. Looks like they were struggling to find something there on that uh, Camaro of Reeves to attach to. Now, uh, just, I think I, if I read the signaling right, uh, they indicated, okay, we're connected. Start to, start to uh, winching it up there. So hopefully we'll see that car make the move up onto the flatbed in short order. And as they're moving past, we could see um, Nick Asayan's car though. He, so he did get that car fired up again. We, he was the guy who stalled on the grid. Uh, he'll be frustrated with that because Nick Nick Asen has made very good progress this year yes, with that he Aston has. Martin. He's been the quickest guy from that TRG team, generally running at least three cars, uh, and he has been the fastest contender. He started today in the 11th position, and he was 
saw him yesterday after the race and yep. he was confident of, of making more improvements today. Steve Cameron, the veteran New Zealander, very accomplished former driver himself, he is the chief engineer on that team and they were making you know, steady strides with the car. They think that uh, in terms of the ballot for, for performance and the overall equality of the cars in GTS class, they may be a little bit down on performance compared to some of the other marks, but the drivers, each of them except for Nick Hussain, don't have a lot of experience. Nick right. is certainly by, by far the most experienced driver in that team, but you know, he is, uh, his experience is beneficial and they are improving those cars and gradually working their way, their way toward the front where they where they need to be. Well, and the interesting thing too is, you know, saying uh, that car, they were having all kinds of problems at the start of the season because these cars in, the, in this series are derived from stock showroom cars and uh, in the ECU units there are all these little codes that are buried for when something goes wrong to a certain point you know it says if this happens it puts the car into what's called limp mode that just shuts it down except for just enough power to basically limp it off a freeway uh, and into a safe spot and the, uh, these little codes were triggering for some reason on, on Nick's car the others weren't suffering from it so much and uh, so he had some very frustrating runs through it all and again this is that experience showing isn't it is he just stayed on on the game plan here and after now five rounds coming in here to the sixth round he's in the top ten in points you know after moving to a brand new team and program uh, that says a lot about his ability looks like we've got the number 40 shadow works Camaro that from the best IT racing team up on the back of the rollback hopefully we'll be able to clear things very quickly and at this point we would uh, still have uh, we're just about 17 minutes in so plenty of racing yet to unfold and I think we're starting to see a bit more urgency now from the field starting to scrub those tires up get them clean get them warm uh, they're anticipating a restart pretty soon yes and uh, I think we're all anticipating that we can't wait for it in actual fact there is a quick look at Andy Lee in car number 20 the Jeff's teammate actually, Jeff's yeah. teammate yes the teammate of the, of the the guy who crashed there in turn two and Andy Lee, had, he'd made a good start. He was running in the one, two, three, fourth position, yep. uh, which is where he's exactly where he started. What was surprising this time at the standing side actually is is how much the order didn't change, yeah. uh, because just about everybody apart from Nick Hussain got away pretty cleanly, and they, with with, uh, with very few exceptions, maintained their grid order all the way through those uh, first few laps of the race. Another reason might be the Cadillacs were up front. Because when you know, like at Barber, when they were seventh and eighth, things changed a lot well, by the time true. they even got to the first turn with that amazing launch control that those guys have. Uh, today, they just uh, let it rip right from the front, and it played out. So, uh, all right, we've got the car. It's on the rollback, and it uh, should be able to fairly quickly just get to one of those one of those exit points. Race control uh, urging on all of the EV crews and our Cadillac safety team uh, to get. Uh, that track clear we want to give these guys as much time to race as possible we might get a restart this time if they can get that cleared up that fast I think they might I certainly hope so ah. the, uh, the lights are certainly on there though it's a, it's a uh, restart this time by the work right? coming from Excellent. race control the lights will be turned off I think they were just turned off there as it came through turn eight so that'll give uh, all the crews will be on the radio from the pit lane to their drivers say we're going to go green this time by and yeah, you can see the lights are now off on that Cadillac safety car, so that will be pulling in now, and then we'll be back to green flag racing. Out of turn 11, that run down along the Detroit River, heading into that very tricky turns 12 and 13, almost a double apex right-hander, not one whit of runoff over there. If you get it wrong, uh, it's, uh, it's a big hit. Alex Vigie found that out last year when he was running the Volvo. This year he's running the McLaren. Well, you don't want to do that. Pace car is in. We are looking forward to the restart. Johnny O'Connell and Andy Pilgrim, the two thundering Cadillac CTS VRs, bringing the field up, but tucked in behind, very close. This is Andrew Palmer, Mike Skeen, James Sofronis, Alex Figge. Here comes the cue. O'Connell waiting for the flag, bringing him up nice and slow. Wants to use the torque of that V8. We're green! And O'Connell leads him up. Skeen trying to get down underneath Palmer. That black and red Hawk performance out. He couldn't quite get it done as they head down into turn one. Uh, and Andrew Palmer there in third place. He blocked the <laughs> inside line to make sure there was no way that Mike Skeen could force his way through on the inside line. Now, this is what happened in reverse positions yesterday at the restart. It was uh, Mike Skeen who was taken advantage of by Andrew Palmer at that turn when at the restart. This time, though, no way for Mike Skeen to redress the balance. Oh, and a nice restart there, an absolutely great restart by Mark Wilkins, who got around down to the inside into turn one of Andy Lee, and he has picked up a spot. And for Buffamani, Lee Wilkins, they are still going to be
be absolutely frustrated because of the fact that Ziegler uh, was not able to get around Martin and Udell again. And so Buff Amani trapped behind and uh, he's losing a little bit of ground again as O'Connell drawn away. Yeah, I think Lawson Eichenbach was in that mix as well yes. in the GGS battle as well, and Chevrolet Camaro trying to go around the outside. He was at turn <laughs> three, but you're right, it's still the Cadillac, particularly Johnny O'Connell has pulled out a little bit of a margin over Andy Pilgrim on that first lap, and the two Audis of, Andy, of, uh, of, of Andrew Palmer and Mike Skeen right there on his rear wheel. And those two McLarens and then the two Ferraris behind them still in the same order they were at the restart. Yeah, and I tell you, you know, we have watched uh, Elizaro. He has not always been the fastest car out there in terms of speed, but his racecraft is superb, and he always finds a way to get to the front. He been is hunting change, right now. Yeah, been a change in GTA. Marcello Hahn in that Lamborghini Gallardo. He's moved himself up ahead of Michael Mills, who I think lost a couple of positions yep. at that restart. Yeah, Marcello, very quick, had an incident yesterday that uh, took him out, uh, but he won one of the reins, uh, the second race at Barber. All right, Lazaro showing the nose to Palmer down into turn one. Could not quite make that move, or this thorn, excuse me. That would have been for seventh. Couldn't quite get it done. Now we're going to go back, see what's unfolding in the GTS battle. There is that white picture car's East Mustang of your leader. That is Dean Martin behind him, 18-year-old Alec Udell, then the GTS car of Ziegler, then Buffamani, then the red and white Kia of Wilkins, then that number one Black Dog Speed Shop Camaro. Oh, and Andy Lee, a problem after such a good start. 2-0, that is Andy Lee. He is at a crawl. Something has gone awry for that uh, Crown 7 Best IT machine. That's a great shame uh. for Andy Lee. He was uh, in the points table. He was running fourth coming into, in, in here. About 90 points behind the leaders is Jack Baldwin, who leads the GTS category this into this race with yep. the two Kia Optimus of Mark Wilkins and Nick Johnson in second and third. But Andy Lee there was right in contention in fourth place. And a, a poor finish here. Boy, that would be... Uh, a big blow to his championship hopes, and he's still not up to speed again. Yeah, he's, I think he's just trying to get it around to the pit lane and uh, see if there's something that the crew can do for that best IT team to try and get him uh, up and running. Again, there is Rahagan leading. There's Udell, then the GT car, the GTA car of Ziegler, and then the rest of this pack. Oh, what an attempt right there. That was a pretty optimistic David Sturks. Uh, actually got inside one of the curves as I think he thought Boucher in the Nissan, the number 51, that OS Geiken Sparco machine was going to turn down on him. And Boucher actually left him a little room, but Sturks, now nah, he's a rallier. So bounding over a couple of curves isn't going to uh, affect him too much. Look at Buff Amani, that blue Mustang with that black stripe, trying anything he can to get around that GTS machine of Ziegler and try and get in and uh, get after this uh, battle up front because those two guys right there just going out of your frame, 50 Martin and 17 Udell are opening it up. And uh, I think Buff Amati, we've seen the speed he's capable of in that morning warm-up, and he just needs to get unleashed a little bit, and he just can't. Yeah, it's uh, super battling going on there. Yeah. Jack Roush Jr., I think, has, has he found a way past Lawson Aschenbach? Yes, he has. He sure has. Yeah. So that was for the fifth position in the GTS category, and right behind those two uh, is uh, Jack Baldwin as well. So great battles there, and that's going to be a battle. Is, 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 there's no doubt about it. That is going to go all the way to the end of this race. That GTS battle is so tight. It is. Meanwhile, up front, there is O'Connell, there is Pilgrim, those two beautiful Cadillacs just easing away a little bit. Uh, the official margin, last time by start finish, between those two cars and the third place machine, about a second and a half. And, uh, you know, they're just trying to, as we said, to open that gap up. So when they catch the back of the GTS field, they've got a little bit of breathing room to uh, to uh, just be a little bit more disciplined in what they have to do in traffic instead of trying to force an issue. That's when incidents can happen. And uh, those two drivers up front, two of the absolute best, not just in terms of speed, but the racecraft of Johnny O'Connell and Andy Pilgrim uh, is remarkable. Yeah, I mean, this is the, the 49th start by Johnny O'Connell in the Pirelli World Challenge, but his teammate, Andy Pilgrim, <laughs> 140th start yeah. for him. He's been around this business a long time. But Johnny O'Connell, of course, uh, huge success in open wheel ranks. And, and then with the, particularly with the Corvette program in American Le Mans series and just gen GT racing in general, huge amount of experience in this sort of a car in particular, big V8 uh, sports cars. And he is excellent, and he's showing his, his capabilities yep. this weekend. Fourth-time Le Mans winner. That, that 
really says it all right there. Well, I'll tell you, in spots, Alec Udell is just all over the back of Dean Martin's picture car's East Ford Mustang, and Alec in that Watson Racing MDG Ford Mustang. Uh, then in other spots, you see Martin ease away just a little bit, and uh, it's, it's just a great cat and mouse game right now. And in between, the, you know, there you see Ziegler, the straight line speed of the big GT V10 Audi, runs up to the back of Udell on the straights, then falls back into the clutches of Buffamani and holds them up when they get into the twisty bits. And uh, that's what keeps it interesting. Boy, Johnny O'Connell not exactly just lagging about here. You can see that car, a little bit of a drift as he comes through that uh, real tricky complex uh, over by the fountain and the uh, the casino, which serves as the media center here on the course of the weekend. He's letting that car flow a little bit, isn't he? Yeah, he is. And uh, you know, the, I think the, the Cadillacs, uh, they're, they're not built to FIA GT3 specification. These are built to World Challenge specification. So they are heavily developed from last year. They've certainly got a bit more performance in, in every aspect over one year ago. There's Andy Lee bringing that number 20 best IT car onto pit lane. We saw the problems for him earlier on. But those Cadillacs, they are super fast and they, they really are suited to this racetrack because they, uh, they got oodles of power. They put the power down really, really well. They were very efficient motor cars and the drivers know what they're doing. So they are, that's no surprise in front of the field and they are pulling away. And Anthony Lazaro got a great run out of turn two. Makes the move or does he? Down into three on young Robert Thorne in the number six McLaren. He does. So Anthony Lazaro now has picked off Thorne. He is now up into seventh and boy did he get an awesome run through turn number two and it gave him the run tucked right in behind got a little bit of a toe off the back of thorns mclaren popped out at the last second absolutely classic deep breaking move and lazaro moves up toward the front getting back to what you were talking about with the cadillacs they run so well early but what happens if it stays green again because of the power they carry more weight then they start uh they will overheat those Pirelli P0 slicks. They're great tires, but if you push them and push them and push them, especially with a heavy car, they'll start to get a little bit hot, they'll lose a little bit of effectiveness, and that's when these GT3 spec cars can start to close it up a little bit. And uh, you know, every once in a while, Johnny O'Connell says, we don't mind a yellow, you know, because it lets us cool those tires and get back into it. Uh, he said, it, it can help us. He said, but if we can get out front and open up a margin, we just rather leave it in our hands. And that's what they're doing right now. Yes, this is Formula One, isn't it? But we've got <laughs> McLaren and Ferrari there. So Lots to like, battle yeah. two cars from each of the teams there in that battle for sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth places. Not too far behind them. We've still got that battle going on in the GTA class. It's still Marcello Hahn who leads. But last time around, Michael Mills, who one assumes must have made a mistake, soon after the restart, as he did yesterday in actual fact, has repassed Tim Pappas in that Mercedes-Benz. So it's now Marcello Hahn, 11th overall, leading in that GTA category. And uh, Michael Mills right behind, not too far behind him. And then right behind him is Tim Pappas. And here's the story in GTS. There's the 50, the white car of Martin. Ooh. And here comes, or he's trying it, the number 16 of Mancuso, trying to get down underneath the McLaren of Thorne. He couldn't do it there. Now he's going to stick his nose in on the other side. They almost touch. And uh, Thorne just driving his line. And Mancuso saying, well, all right, that's not going to work. But in front of the two of them, as they come out of turn seven and start the blast down the strand, again, Anthony Lazaro has got himself tucked right under the wing now of Alex Figgy. Figgy way to the right side wall to protect, not wanting to give any room to Lazaro to try and make a move. And Lazaro said, all right, well, that's a good defense. I've got to just back off. And race control now radioing all the corners and all the teams and saying, all right, the GT leaders are coming up to the back of the GTS group. And as we've said it before, that's when this turns from a race into a war. And that's exactly what we're seeing play out here right now. And Buffamani is under huge pressure right now from the 38 of Mark Wilkins as uh, it looks like Nick Janssen has had a problem and has dropped off the map just a little bit. And Wilkins is hounding Buffamani, and that's because they, of course, are getting caught up behind. And oh, good run here, Palmer and Skeen. Yeah, just fighting their way past Buzz McCall. They're going to turn one. Buzz McCall in the uh, number 72 Motul Stop Tech reset MD, Porsche Cayman S, and slow through turn one, but they just about managed to pick their way through, and that has allowed James Safronas to move in there. So the three Audi's very close together. You see Anthony Lazaro once again. This time moving past the other of the McLarens into turn three to take over in sixth place. Yeah, getting around Alex Figgy, and that was close. Figgy defended, and Lazaro came up. And I think Lazaro sort of drifted right next to him and said, 
It was a little close, bud. Give me some room. It went through, and then uh, Alizaro, again showing that race craft, wasted zero time finding a line to get right around Buzz McCall, and look what it's done. That has allowed him now to very quickly, once he got around and used Buzz McCall a little bit as a pick, that's what you do. You know, that's this chess match that you play, and he's quickly opened up a nice margin. Now Mancuso continuing his attack on Thorne. Takes a look. Not enough. And we saw this yesterday. In fact, we've yeah. seen it most of the races this season. The Ferraris really come on strong towards the end of the races. The drivers, look, I think, looking after their tyres in the early in the early parts of the race, uh, and then by the, by the uh, latter stages, the tyres are really, really good shape and able to push on hard. Certainly, we saw that yesterday. Anthony Lazaro flew in the closing stages of the race to uh, move up into the third position and perhaps we'll see that now he's up into six now so he's got a little bit of a deficit to make up before he can catch up the, to the th trio of Audis in front of him. By the way just past the halfway mark we have a correction on the Optima Battery's best standing start a clarification came in it was actually in GTS it was the 51 of Rick Bechet getting the Optima Battery's best standing start nice job for Rick and uh, he's, he's really that team has found some stuff this year and they're 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 really delayed uh, they still have some development problems they're 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 developing these Nissans and GTS pretty much on their own uh, but they've really turned a corner I think in having a great run so uh, enjoying watching that but Lazaro and it it seems to a degree uh, Jeremy that Lazaro's setup on that car uh, is even a little bit more in uh, you know toward the end of, of, of a longer run he really likes that car uh, you know He's not there sometimes right at the start and then just wicked quick uh, at the end of the race. And boy, he is now starting to close up a bit and rather rapidly on that phenomenal battle we've been following for third between Palmer in the Global Motorsports Group 21, Skeen in the number two Hawk Performance car, and uh, then Sophronis. And uh, right there is Lazaro. So he is starting to, uh, he has turned the wick up just a little bit. Uh, his best lap right now, a 133.5. And uh, he's, but he's, the thing is for him is he's turning 33 fives and six regularly and is quickly closing up. Lazaro, well, I'll tell you, he is an immensely experienced, uh, talented driver. And uh, this is his first season in the Pirelli World Challenge. And this series is lucky to have him. He is, uh, he's pretty special. Yeah, and uh, you talked about it a little while ago, Nick Jonsson there in kind of a 36 the Kia Optima. Uh, Turbo, he has had clearly has had some problems. Yes. He seems to have uh, he's not taking part in the race, and again, that is going to be a big dent in his championship asp championship aspirations. Because if you don't finish here, you lose an awful lot of ground to the other front runners. Nick Johnson was third place yeah. in points coming into this race. He's going to fall back from there. Yeah, tough, tough day here, and uh, he, that's sort of been his mo ever since this team came into the World Challenge. Uh, he either wins. You know, podiums and wins or DNFs, and it's just a, it's a, you know it's just a luck thing sometimes. Here's that battle we've uh, continued to be watching here between uh, uh, again uh, the blue number 33, the Capaldi Racing Ford Racing entry of Buffamonte, Mark Wilkins in the remaining 38 Kia, and then right behind them uh, now the 60 of Jack Roush, and then a little bit of drift to them. Yeah. I think Jack Baldwin may have gone around. Yeah, he did. Baldwin has gone around Lawson Aschenbach. That should put him up now into the sixth spot. Uh, but here's the deal. Ziegler now is gone. And yeah. look how quickly Buffamani has reeled in Udell, and he's bringing Wilkins and Roush with him. And, uh, oh, boy, Andy Lee, this it, this is a tough, tough day. As he's been in and out of the pits after whatever that problem was developed, now he's stuck down in the runoff, which tells you it may be a break-related issue. You just can't get the car to slow down. We're just speculating there. But now... This is when it's going to get fierce in GTS, Jeremy, because those top five, uh, here they are. The number 50. Yeah, and we've lost uh, 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 lost Nashville back again as well, haven't yes. we? He's gone missing from that group as well. He was right in the thick of it. Yeah, Buffamani now, that blue car, is all over the back of the black and white Mustang. That is uh, Alec Udell, the 18-year-old phenom, who is having himself one heck of a race here today. He had a podium and a fast lap here last year, and he was really not happy uh, with yesterday. He said... We know we could do better. We're going to, and boy, have they. Yeah, we've got to pretty much six cars yeah, here, nose to tell. So the first four, absolutely nose to tell. Then maybe a couple of car lengths in between the next two as well. And in the meantime, Anthony Lazaro is absolutely flying. He's caught up with those three outers in front of him. Now, though, he's got to find a way past them. And James Sofronis is the first in line. He's in that kind of a 14. He is a guy that's going to, that Anthony Lazaro is going to have to pass first if he's going to move up from his current sixth position. And about 15 minutes to go, about 15 minutes left in this one, folks. So uh, it is uh, it is time to, for everybody to get angry here. And Andy Pilgrim just turning his best lap of the race. Palmer did as well. Sophronis did. 
And again, another very quick. Uh, at this point, Anthony Lazaro, listen to this, folks, has turned to 1 minute 32.8. Uh, that is a very quick lap. The only guy who's been faster is Johnny O'Connell with clear track up front. And uh, right now the margin between O'Connell and his teammate, seven-tenths of a second. But between Pilgrim in second and Palmer in third, seven seconds. So today clearly is Cadillac's day here on Belle Isle. And at this point, what do you think? You know, I mean, uh, Johnny's won now, four or five. You think Andy decides it's time to race him and actually go after him, or is uh, is Andy going to continue to play wingman here? The two of them are awfully close on track right now. As we go back here, there they come out of turn two, this long run down into turn three, coming up on lots of GT traffic. Jorge De La Torre there. Pilgrim, late move, showed the nose, then decided, no, yeah. Yeah, with Johnny right up behind that Aston Martin, that could have ended in tears. But, you know, Andy is an amazing overtaker, I thought. Maybe this is game on yeah. time. No, he, he wasn't trying to pass today. He was just looking to the inside, <laughs> trying to trying to sort of fake out Johnny O'Connell, I think, more than anything else. He never, he, he moved to the inside, yes, but he never uh, sort of ducked late on the brakes yeah. to try and actually make the move. He's just making sure that Johnny knows he's there, he's ready to pounce. But, you know, Andy Pilgrim, he's a team player as well. The, the, the last thing he wants to do is cause any problems Absolutely. for Johnny O'Connell. In terms of the championship standings, uh, Andy Pilgrim is quite some way back. He's over 100. 125 points back in fourth place. So it's Johnny O'Connor as the championship leader. That is the big picture here. Oh, Andy Pilgrim, a huge tank slapper, as he thought he was going to have a lane to get down underneath Chris Outson, and it just suddenly went completely sideways on him. Uh, excuse me, I don't know that that was Outson. It was one of the always evolving cars. Brilliant save, but that now has cost him a large chunk of time uh, back to O'Connell. That margin has ballooned from, well, as we said, almost uh, close enough to try and move to the better part of 10 car lengths. That was a big tank slapper, and it was a brilliant save by Pilgrim. <laughs> yes, he was. He that certainly got his attention there and has enabled Johnny O'Connell for the first time in a little while now having a little bit of breathing space at the front of the field. Lap 19 completed by the race leaders. They've got a, a handy margin of ooh, about four and a half seconds over the pursuers and it is still Andrew Palmer who leads that battle in car number 21 followed by Mike Skeen a little bit of a margin between those two last time around and then James Safron is in car number 14 and right behind him Anthony Lazaro we have a car spun at turn seven and uh, trying to I think that's the 62 that might be Clennon and the field coming up here everybody trying to uh, weave their way through Plus, we've got some of this action now as that battle for third, fourth, fifth, and sixth in GTS coming up through some of this GT, uh, GTS traffic uh, in GT. And this is uh, going to be fierce. And, uh, boy, Lazaro, actually, he got hurt. He's still trapped in that. He had been all over the back of Sopronis, and now he's lost a little bit of touch. But uh, is that, uh, no, that's Gene getting around Rick Boucher. Whew, this is some fierce stuff. Yeah, great battling going on here up and down the field. We still see, though, that, that uh, Aston Martin of, of Mark Clendon is stuck in the middle of the road. And, oh, finally, he's got oh, it. Uh, got some power there. Got, to get, got it out of the way. Pulled off into the, uh, into the safe area. Uh, that is at turn seven. And uh, he will now wait for a gap in the traffic to rejoin the race. But certainly it's cost him a lot of ground. Now, here's that battle in GTS. And guess who's right in the midst of it? The two Cadillacs coming through. There is uh, Martin in that white picture car's East car, the black and white Mustang, right behind him a Yadell, the blue and black Mustang, a Capaldi, or the Capaldi racing Buffamani driven car, then Wilkins in the Kia. And now Jack Roush is going to get uh, a little bit trapped out, lose some touch. That's going to bring Baldwin right up on the back of Roush at this stage as those caddies are working their way through. And that would be a, that would be a battle, obviously, for the uh, fifth spot that's going to shape up now between Baldwin and Roush. The two jacks in the field here as uh, we are watching. And the Cadillacs right now, they need to be a little bit careful because this is the GTS lead battle. They don't want to do anything to uh, uh, hurt anything there. Buffamani sees him coming, lets one go. That's And that's what he wanted to do. He used that as a, that's, uh, that's what I mean. Let the one guy go, keep the other guy behind you. That gave him a little bit of breathing room. Uh, back to Wilkins. And now on this straight, the Cadillacs uh, might just be able to clear him. Yeah, and traffic giveth and taketh away. And Always. certainly uh, Andy Pilgrim now closed in again. He was within a second last time around. He's, he's a little bit farther back. The two McLaren still nose to tail. It is car number nine ahead of car number six. So Alex Figgy ahead of his young teammate, Robert Thorne. But they've been cleared by both of the Ferraris now. Nick Mancuso has managed to find his way past as well, following from his team leader, Anthony Lazaro, a little while ago. And Anthony Lazaro, he's pulled 
uh, quite some way up the road and he's still challenging James Sofonis for the fifth position. Kanu is 14 and 61, but Lazaro not yet able to make that move. Here there is this battle Ten for the minutes. lead in GTS. Ten minutes to go and Udell, they must have heard that on the radio. He must have said, all right, it's go time. I've got to do something here because even after the uh, the Cadillacs worked their way through, got Buffamani back a little bit, he's quickly reeling this uh, these two guys in again. And coming up on him now is Andrew Palmer. So he wants to get around Martin if he can before the rest of this GT field mounts its attack. There are the two Cadillacs out front overall in GT. Here comes Martin. There's Udell. Here comes Palmer. He's uh, as Martin's defending on Udell. Palmer is going to try and get around the outside. Then he gets in between those two. Buffamani is going to try and ride the outside, try and do something with Udell. He can't do it. Udell now has Skeen in the blackout. He inside and Buffamani on the outside shoulder of Udell, almost a touch. And let's see. Does Sofronis try and knife down underneath? He can't. But right behind him, of course, you've got Lazaro trying to get by the Kia of Wilkins. Boy, this is just frantic. That's a real traffic jam at oh. turn six. And James and Frontis are really having to defend from Anti Lazaro as they get on the main strand straight away there. Sort of straight away. He <laughs> bends from first to the right and then to the left going in to turn seven. But Anti Lazaro all over the back end of James Sofronis. And finally, does he make that move he at did. turn seven? Yes, he does. He slices through. And again, now you can see with that move, uh, now you've got those, those two. Uh-oh, we've got Jack, Jack Rouse, Rouse Jr. Jr has found the barriers. And that is going to bring out a full course caution. That yeah. is turn seven and as well, isn't it? There's a bit of debris down there. Yep, that is. There's a whole oh, bunch boy. of debris. All the cars trying to fight their way through. There go the GTA leaders there through that uh, debris field as a result of the incident. Oh, no, Alex That's Udell, Udell as well. That's at turn 12. Udell involved, or is this a separate, separate, separate incident? Separate incident. Yes, indeed, it is different part of the racetrack. All right, oh, so Udell man. able to reverse out and drive away. He's probably pretty wounded, perhaps. But, uh, oh, my goodness, unbelievable what's unfolding here. And there's Roush. Yeah, he's going nowhere. That car, the left front corner, comprehensively crumpled. And uh, we're, we're getting the yet, call from we? race control. Safety cars stand up. So now's where, obviously, you can see Mancuso trying to get through. The, it is not called for the full course yellow yet. Now it comes. Full course caution. Oh boy, with eight minutes remaining, uh, this is tough. You hate to see this happen, and we don't know. Uh, we were sitting there watching Roush's car up against the barriers, and then something apparently happened with Udell uh, at a different part of the track. Now, on the upside uh, for everybody chasing those two Cadillacs, if we do go back to green, suddenly Palmer, Skeen, Lazaro, and Lazaro has been awfully quick, will be right there. On the other hand, those Cadillacs get to cool those tires off, and we've talked about that. Uh, but I'm not sure how quickly this is going to be able to get cleaned up. No, we've got, what, uh, seven and a half minutes to go in the race. And uh, that car is uh, heavily parked against the barriers there in turn seven. So it's going to take a bit of extracting to get that car yep. out of the way. And there's quite a bit of debris around there as well, as we saw earlier on. We saw several cars running over it. And we've got to hope that they don't pick up any punctures as a result Absolutely. of that. So at this time, it is O'Connell and Pilgrim and the two Cadillacs out front, the 21 Global Motorsports Group Audi of Andrew Palmer in third. The Hawk Performance Audi of Mike Skeen, number two and fourth. Anthony Lazaro in the R Ferry Motorsports Ferrari in the fifth spot, number 61. Then it's James Sofronis, Nick Mancuso, Alex Figgy, Robert Thorne, and Tim Bergmeister in the Porsche completing the top ten. Marcello Hahn now sits in the 11th spot overall, the leader essentially in the GTA category. And looking to see if we're going to find out what happened here. There's a look at Udell. Oh, and he uh, was there and just got a uh, little tap. Uh, and I don't know whether, it was tough to tell, Jeremy, whether it was Udell turning in and touched or if the Audi floated out a little bit. But just enough of a touch, it changed the direction for Udell. He was already right at that limit on the barriers, and they just caught him. Yeah, that's a great shame for young Alec Udell. It was a great drive he was putting on there. Absolutely. That uh, car had been heavily damaged at Barbas Motorsports Park a few weeks ago. They've done a super job to repair it. And they had problems here in the first practice session. Here it is again. And uh, a late move down the inside there by, well, no, it's a perfectly leg legitimate down the inside. And I have to say, Alec Udell just kind of misjudged it a little bit, just turned it a little bit too soon. Uh, I guess he thought the Audi was going to be quicker through the corner than it was, and he, he got to yep. a point where he kind of had to turn into the corner and just glanced off the left rear corner of the Audi. 
and that was enough to cannon him off into the outside wall there. So a heavy impact once again for Alec Udell. That's a, a great share because he's it been truly is. really putting the pressure on yesterday's race winner, Dean Martin. I have not yet seen uh, a replay, uh, I hope we will see it, of what may have happened with uh, Jack Rose Jr. Uh, while we're waiting for that again, just to just to fill things in quickly, Marcello Hahn leading in GTA, 10th overall over Mike Mills, who's 11th overall in the Porsche, 12th overall again. Boy, another podium for Dan Knox and the Viper on the cards. That's fantastic. We're going to step away on the web at world-challenge-tv.com for just a second. Uh, we will be right back, uh, hopefully, with a little bit of green flag racing to the finish here at Belle Isle. And we're welcoming back our audience on our global feed at world-challenge-tv.com. Continuing under caution here uh, at Belle Isle. Uh, so, so sad to see this uh, potentially finish under caution. But let's uh, set the stage. I wanted to make mention here uh, for everybody on the web as well. In fifth spot in GTS is Rick Boucher and that OS Geiken Sparco SFR uh, Nissan. What an amazing day for that team. Uh, they have been really developing this Nissan GTS uh, platform uh, on their own for a while. And they've turned a couple of corners this year in terms of, of, of performance. Still have had the odd reliability issue, but boy, have they put on a drive today. And David Sturks, you know, the uh, rally specialist from Brussels, Belgium, sitting in the sixth spot in the always evolving Autotopia Mustang up into sixth. Great run for them as well. Very much so. That would certainly be the best result uh, for, for that team this season. The best uh, positions they've had uh, so far as a couple of eighth place finishes so that would be a strong run for them and as you say also yeah, Rick Boucher who's uh, looking for a top five finish and he would be delighted with that they've uh, it's a relatively small team they're working hard to, to do the best they can with that Nissan 370Z they don't have any factory support there so they are working as hard as they possibly can and uh, his best finishes prior to this weekend was a couple of seventh places so potentially a career best result there absolutely for Rick Boucher looking forward to uh, I'm such a great group too just uh, absolutely hardworking uh, fun loving but uh, you know very committed and that's what makes it special you know there's so many things you know could have would have should us here with this caution if, if if we don't get going again and, and, and there's no way we're going to I just, I just don't see that happening but boy if Anthony Lazaro would have been able to continue that charge would have been absolutely exceptional and what was coming in gts that was going to be just insane as well it was and we could see that uh, alex figgy didn't get going at all there he's he's st stopped out there on the racetrack at turn seven as well so it looks like his race is over he'd been running in the eighth position so he's given that up he's taken over by his teammate robert thorne so that was a uh, a shame for jim huey's team there kpax racing uh, the two cars have really been running in tandem pretty much all the way through the, all the, way through the weekend, in actual fact, uh, with Alex Figge holding the upper hand in the early stage of the race. Both of them, though, were picked off by the two R Ferry Motorsports Ferraris, but they were still running strongly in eighth and ninth places. Not where they want to be, but they are still learning those cars. The McLarens, they only began to put this program together in late January. The cars were delivered, one of the cars was delivered right at the end of January. The second car came along quite a bit later, so they had... They've had virtually no development time, virtually no testing uh, once the season has got underway. So they're very much behind the eight ball with those McLaren uh, MP4 12 Cs. But Absolutely. it's a great car and there's a lot of potential in there which they haven't yet quite uh, completely unlocked. But there is a McLaren engineer, here, uh, engineer over here from the factory in England at every race and they are making big strides with that car. White flag is out, so it is going to be a finish under caution, folks. Uh, this obviously never the way we want to see it happen, but safety is absolutely paramount. And with that car still down there and wounded, just nothing we could do about it. Uh, so uh, as they run now, it will be how they finish unless somebody uh, breaks under caution. And believe it or not, in this series, we've seen that. Johnny O'Connell last year at Long Beach thought he had it won under caution. What he didn't know for a moment was that the car that had caused the caution, Alex Figgy's uh, Volvo, blew a brake rotor and it popped a piece of rotor right through Johnny O's radiator and two thirds of the way through the final lap, he ground to a halt and uh, it all changed up. So don't see that maybe happening here today, but uh, you never know till that checker flies. So that's, uh, that's the scenario. So Jeremy, I will leave you to wrap things up here. I'm gonna get an early start over to Victory Circle, where I'm sure we'll be talking with some very happy and maybe a couple of frustrated drivers, uh, as is always the case in the competitive nature of this series. Thank you, Greg Kramer. And that has been uh, certainly a shame that the race should finish under yellow.
Um, but uh, for Johnny O'Connell, hey, he's been there, done that. He's been around this for a long, long time, almost 30 years of racing experience. And he has used every bit of that this race, race craft this weekend. He's hot off the, off the line here with that Cadillac CTS VR, and he has never looked back. A couple of times he's come with a little bit of pressure from his teammate, Andy Pilgrim, but on each occasion, Johnny O'Connell able to eke out a little bit more of an advantage and he was still out comfortably out in front when the yellow flags came out and uh, now following that Cadillac safety car home to the finish line. It would be the win number 13 for Johnny O'Connell in Pirelli World Challenge competition. This will cement his lead at the head of the championship standings and it was also cement the lead for Cadillac in the Manufacturers Championship uh, coming into this weekend. They uh, held the advantage of just four points over Ferrari. That was extended yesterday to nine points with the win for Cadillac and a the best of a third place finish for the Ferrari Ferrari cars. And this afternoon it will be extended even more because Cadillac comes away with a win and the best of the Ferraris is only in fifth place. So uh, that is uh, going to put Cadillac in a very strong con con uh, lead in the championship for the Manufacturers Championship for GT. In GTS, the win again for Ford, Ford's second winner in a row, and that will move Ford from third place this morning in the Manufacturers Championship in GTS, I believe, into the championship lead, because 10 more points, nine points for the victory, one point for the pole position, that will vault them ahead of both Kia and Porsche for the lead in GTS Manufacturers. Here comes our checkered flag. There is Johnny O'Connell to take the victory. His teammate making another photo finish for Cadillac here in the Cadillac V-Series Challenge at Belle Isle, race number two of this weekend. And there is our race winner in GTS, Dean Martin. Again, a clean sweep for Ford Mustang. The, uh, some of the awards given out for this race, the Optima Battery's best standing start goes to number 51, Rick Boucher. Made up seven spots at the start line. The Invisible Glass clean pass to the race for car number 60, Jack Rouse Jr. So com some consolation at least for a car that ended up heavily against the wall. Uh, Antony Lazaro was, was uh, named as the Cadillac CTS move of the race for his pass of the McLarens moving up through the field. And the Sunoco Hard Charger, 13 positions made up during a race by Rick Boucher. That uh, Optima Battery's best standing start. He translated that into a a career best fifth place finish for that car number 51. So hats off to those guys. Uh, but our race winners today, there is Dean Martin. Here is Johnny O'Connell, the veteran driver. He loves every race win. Every race for him is, is a lot of fun. When he comes away with the, with, the, with the victory as well, it's so much sweeter. Let's run down the top finishers then in the GT class. Our race winner, car number, number three, Johnny O'Connell in the Cadillac Racing Cadillac CTS VR. Second place, Andy Pilgrim, his teammate. Third place for Audi, car number 21, Andrew Palmer. Fourth place, also in an Audi, car number two, Mike Skeen. Then the first of the Ferraris, Anthony Lazaro, who did manage to find a way past James Sofronis. So Anthony Lazaro in car number 61 finishes fifth. James Sofronis for Audi in car number 14 in sixth place. The Lazaro's teammate, is uh, Nick Mancuso, he finishes in seventh ahead of car number six, Robert Thorne, the best of the K-Pax racing McLarens. Tim Bergmeister for effort racing Porsche, car number 31 in ninth place and rounding out the top 10, our GTA winner this afternoon, this, you know, just about afternoon now, is Marcello Hahn in the writer engineering Lamborghini Gallardo. And that will tighten up the points again in the GTA category. Let's have a look now at the GTS finishes. Once again, a perfect performance from Dean Martin. He led from the pole position and has led all the way in this race to come away with his second win of the weekend, second win of the season, the third win of his career, all of them coming right here on the raceway at Belle Isle. Uh, farther down the order, it's quick before we go to that, we'll look down the overall finishing order. In 11th place, Michael Mills, the second of the GTA contenders followed by Dan Knox in car number 80, then Henrik Hedman, Tim Pappas, Brett Curtis, Brent Holden, and Bill Ziegler rounding out the GTE field. And in 18th place overall, our GTS leader, Dean Martin, just from Tony Bufamanti, who moves up into second place in car number 33. 
third place is Mark Wilkins in the Kia Optima. That would be good championship points for the Canadian driver, Mark Wilkins, and that probably will be enough to move him again what, back up into the lead in the GTS points this afternoon. Behind Mark Wilkins comes Jack Baldwin. Oh, Jack Baldwin actually finishes next in line, so that's going to be very tight on the points going into the next re couple of rounds on the championship. But Jack Baldwin finishes 21st overall. Behind him, Rick Boucher, his best finish of his career in that Nissan Motul SPL Nissan 370Z in 22nd place overall. A career's best finish also for car number 52, David Sturks for the always evolving racing Ford Mustang. Then is Alec Udell who brings that Watson racing car number 17 Ford Mustang across the line, heavily damaged on the left front corner, but he got it out of the wall there. Having made that mistake in turn 12, he does at least get a good finish. And Drew Reggitz there in the best of the Aston Martins, car number 02. He finishes in the 25th position overall, followed by Brad Adams and uh, Mitch Landry, and then Tony Gaples in the next position, followed by Nick Essayan, who made up well from that stall at the start, and then Eric Davis in car number 75, the second of the always evolving racing entries. So the race is not, has finished not the way we wanted to under yellow flags, but certainly a great day in GTS for Dean Martin, in GT for Johnny O'Connell. It will be Johnny O'Connell who leads the championship away from Belle Isle and on to the next couple of rounds of the championship, which will take place uh, later this month at Road America. Thanks for joining us here on worldchallengetv.com and for everybody here at the Raceway of Belle Isle. My name is Jeremy Shaw. My thanks also to Greg Kramer and all the production crew here. We will see you again at Road America in a couple of weeks' time.